In this video, we're going to explore carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, which is NMR spectroscopy of carbons based on the isotope carbon-13. And this will give us information about the electronic environments of carbons and the functional groups present in a molecule, as well as some information about symmetry if we don't have as many signals as we have numbers of carbons in, say, the molecular formula. Carbon-13 NMR, while useful theoretically, has a number of practical limitations. Carbon-13 has an NMR active nucleus with nuclear spin, but the abundance of this isotope is low. Only about 1.1% of carbon atoms are carbon-13. That makes this technique intrinsically insensitive with a low signal-to-noise ratio, and you'll notice a lot of noise in the baseline of carbon-13 NMR spectra because of the low abundance of carbon. This also eliminates coupling of carbon-13 nuclei with each other and makes integrations not useful. And all of these add up to some problems with carbon-13 NMR relative to proton. Now we can still get useful information out of carbon-13 NMR spectra, but it's not as powerful a technique as proton NMR. Now, carbon-13 is an NMR active nucleus, and the proton is NMR active, and so anytime we have a CH, CH2, CH3 group, those hydrogens are going to couple to the carbon and cause splitting of the carbon NMR signals. This creates a mess of splitting, typically, because of the large number of hydrogens in the vicinity of each carbon, and so we use a technique called broadband decoupling in, cal in, uh, in taking carbon NMR spectra that eliminates this coupling of hydrogens with carbons. Essentially, all of the proton nuclear spins are irradiated with light that excites them and eliminates the splitting of each carbon signal as a result. Because we don't see coupling in carbon-13 NMR spectra and the integrations are not useful, only chemical shifts are reported in carbon-13 NMR spectra. In some cases, occasionally, you'll see the shape of the signal, what the shape of the signal would be in the absence of broadband decoupling, which gives us insight into the number of hydrogens connected to carbons. But we'll discuss depth here shortly, which is a carbon-13 NMR technique that also gives us this same information. So a few things about a typical carbon-13 NMR spectrum. The first thing is chemical shift is still the x-axis. We still have this issue where resonance frequencies, NMR resonance frequencies, depend on the magnetic field strength of the instrument. To eliminate this dependence, we set a standard at 0 ppm that is still tetramethylsilane. Now it's the carbons of tetramethylsilane and their resonance frequency. And then we express the resonance frequencies of other carbons relative to TMS dividing by the operating frequency of the instrument. This gives rise to chemical shift. Notice here that for a carbon-13 spectrum, the range of chemical shifts is much, much wider than the about 0 to 10 range we saw in proton NMR spectra. In carbon NMR, the scale runs from about 0 to 200, maybe 220 ppm. So much wider scale, we only see singlets, and the integrations are not super useful. The intensity of a carbon-13 NMR spectrum uh, signal depends not just on the number of carbons that are there, but other structural features that make the integrations complicated and, and not very easy to interpret. When we talked about chemical shift in proton NMR, the idea there was the chemical shift is often related to the electron density around each proton. Inductive effects by, for example, electron withdrawing electronegative heteroatoms will tend to shift resonances downfield, as will magnetic anisotropy effects due to pi electrons in alkenes and aromatics. Similar ideas apply in carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy, so we're going to use really analogous concepts to understand chemical shifts in carbon NMR. We already noted that resonance frequencies in carbon NMR in ppm vary over a much wider range than proton frequencies, typically 0 for TMS to about 220 ppm for heavily de-shielded carbons, um, for example, carbons in CO double bonds. And as in proton NMR, greater, greater chemical shift corresponds to de-shielded carbons with low electron density around them, and we still refer to this region sort of to the left of the carbon NMR spectrum as downfield. Now, as in proton NMR, chemically equivalent carbons, carbons that are homotopic related by an axis of rotation or enantiotopic related by a plane of symmetry, give equivalent chemical shifts and give rise to one signal. 
and we can use this idea to infer the number of signals we would expect in a carbon NMR spectrum from the molecular structure. And three examples are shown here. For example, in this middle structure, we have a plane of symmetry or an axis of rotational symmetry that's right there. And each of these carbons would give rise to a unique signal because those carbons aren't related by this axis of symmetry. For example, this one is two carbons away from the methyl, this one is right next to the methyl, this one is also two carbons away from the methyl but on the other side of the molecule and farther away from this methyl group, right, and so on and so forth. The carbons over here, though, are symmetrically related to those on the left, and so we would expect these three to give the same chemical shifts to be part of the same signal as these three over here. So we would expect five signals total in this molecule in the middle, and it's worth pausing the video and working through the other two examples to verify that we would expect four signals in this case and only three signals in this case. Now, typical chemical shift ranges for signals in carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy are shown at the bottom of this slide. And this is really a good sort of set of ranges to keep in mind as far as benchmarks go because, you know, the details of where particular functional groups show up will appear in a correlation chart that you might have provided on an exam, but these ranges, appreciating these ranges, will just make you more efficient at solving carbon NMR spectra and using carbon NMR spectra. So about 150 to 220, this heavily deshielded region is typically due to CO double bonds with various things attached here and here. About 100 to 150, we get into our carbon-carbon double bond um, functional groups, alkenes and aromatics. Notice this is quite similar to proton NMR, where we find aldehydes and carboxylic acids way out here. We find sort of the alkene and uh, aromatic CH right in this area and on from there. Just as in proton NMR, alkynes are actually a bit shielded, a bit upfield of alkenes due to magnetic anisotropy effects. And typically between 50 and 100, we find carbon carbons, uh, carbons connected to electronegative atoms, like nitrogen and oxygen, as well as carbons that are part of alkynes, carbon-carbon triple bonds. And then below 50, we're gonna see our typical kind of alkyl carbons, sp3 hybridized, not experiencing any significant inductive effects like this. Those are gonna be way on the upfield end of the chemical shift scale. Let's take a look at this compound and predict the nature of the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. What we're going to need to do this is to first predict the number of signals we expect, taking into account symmetry, things like homotopic and enantiotopic carbons, and then we're going to need to consider the chemical shift of each unique set of carbons. All right, let's start with the unique carbons and the number of signals. So I'm going to start by highlighting this carbon red. Now, the other methyl group here is not equivalent to this methyl group. Notice that at the other carbon of the alkene, we've got two different groups attached, an H and a carbonyl, CO double bond. This red methyl is cis to the H, but this methyl group is trans to the H. These are diastereotopic methyl groups in different chemical environments, different electronic environments. So they are chemically inequivalent, and we would expect two different signals for these. The alkene carbon is naturally different to those first two, and it, this carbon in green is also different from the other carbon involved in the carbon-carbon double bond, which is closer to the CO double bond, and the carbon in the middle, the carbonyl carbon, CO double bond carbon, is also unique. Now one thing we can notice at this point is that this molecule is symmetric. It's got the same groups connected to the central carbonyl carbon. So it has an axis of rotational symmetry that runs right through the middle of the CO double bond, vertical from our viewpoint here. And if we turn over the molecule, rotate it by 180 degrees, we get an image that looks exactly the same as what we started with. This means that these carbons on the right are chemically equivalent to the corresponding carbons on the left-hand side of the molecule. So I'm gonna go ahead and highlight those. And what we realize from this is that we would expect one, two, three, four, five unique signals in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. Now, let's move to talking about where we would expect these to show up in terms of chemical shift. The methyl groups look more or less like plain vanilla alkyl groups, maybe a bit of an inductive effect from the nearby carbonyl, but I'd expect these to be around maybe 30 to 50 ppm, something like this. 
Likewise with the, the orange signal is going to be in the same ballpark. They'll differ from each other because they are chemically inequivalent, but they'll be pretty similar in chemical shift. The green carbon is highly unique. Um, and it's, it's not just a plain vanilla alkene carbon. You may think, okay, this looks like an alkene, so I'm going to go to my typical chemical shift range here and say this is maybe somewhere between 150 and 100, maybe about 125 ppm. But this carbon is particularly special because it is extremely electron deficient due to resonance like this. We can put positive charge at that carbon thanks to the electron withdrawing properties of the carbonyl. This shifts that carbon way downfield. It looks a lot like a carbonyl carbon, in fact, up at 200 ppm as opposed to the 125, 130 that we'd expect for a plain vanilla alkene carbon. And this carbon is actually much more like a plain vanilla alkene. Again, experiencing some inductive effect from the carbonyl group, but probably something like 130 ppm, maybe a bit more downfield, 150, something like that would be expected for this carbon. The pink carbon here is a carbonyl carbon. It's going to be heavily, heavily deshielded, way, way downfield due to the carbonyl oxygen. And so that's going to show up at about 200 ppm. Probably, I would predict, downfield of the um, green signal be just because this is closer to the electronegative oxygen atom, but they'll be in the same ballpark around 200 ppm. So the most important thing here is that we would expect five signals in the carbon NMR spectrum in the approximate chemical re shift ranges you see here with two peaks sort of clustered downfield, one peak in the middle, and two peaks showing up quite a bit upfield. 